Thanks, Kathy, and thanks everyone for coming along today. I wanted to give this talk, um, I guess I had the idea for it about a year ago when I heard about this, this um, museum and library that had been founded in Indiana, USA, by, the, by, by Bush the Elder's Vice President Dan Quayle. So he created a museum about vice presidents. So I thought I'd do it on a smaller scale, being the sitting deputy mayor, I would talk about a previous deputy mayor of the town. And the only one I could think of off the top of my head was a guy called Otto Nothling, um, who I knew about because he was the deputy to Billy Domain, and I'd done a bit of research into Domain. So I knew the name Nothling because I knew he had given some good speeches, particularly when Domain turned 80 when he was mayor, and Nothling spoke about him quite a bit. So, but then I very quickly, almost immediately after I decided I was going to do it on Nothling, I realized that his time as deputy mayor was really one of the most inconsequential parts of his life, that um, his life was actually a really inspiring one for Australia about somebody who played hard and worked hard. And uh, it was kind of the kind of life that if he had been born three or four years earlier, he would have died in the trenches of France or on the, on the shore of Gallipoli and would really mark out as somebody who just died in his prime with so much ahead of him. But because he was born on the 1st of August, 1900, he was just too young, um, just, only just too young to be sent uh, to World War I to go serve. So he lived a full life, despite um, dying at the age of 65. In that time, he, um, he basically um, achieved 10 lifetimes full of achievements. So I want to talk to you quite a bit about what he did, um, including a little bit when he was the deputy mayor. So he was born, as I said, in August 1900 near Mullaney on the Sunshine Coast hinterland at a, a sort of a township place area that was called um, Teutonberg, T-E-U-T-O-B-E-R-G. And it was called that at the time. You can see here, you can just see it says uh, C.M. Knopfling's Vineyard. That was his father, Carl Knopfling. Uh, I think they were Prussian. Pr they were, it was a Prussian family, uh, Knopfling. Um, and it wasn't called Teutonberg for too much longer, though, because during World War I, a lot of German, Germanic-sounding places had their names changed. So it was changed to Widda, which still sounds a bit German, but it actually means Dingo, I think, in the indigenous place uh, where it's from on the Sunshine Coast hinterland. But uh, Tudorberg actually is a very Germanic name because it's the forest where in 9 AD um, the Germanic tribes came together and routed the Romans in the worst um, defeat for the Romans. They lost three legions in 9 AD in the forest of Tudorberg. So it could actually have been a very um, a rallying cry for Germanic people. So that is perhaps um, Nothling's father there in the field. I don't know. Um, so he went to school nearby at the Wumbai State School, but, he, but Otto very early um, was marked out for, with extraordinary academic um, gifts, and he got a scholarship to the Brisbane Boys Grammar School. And as you can see here, um, he achieved what was quite remarkable, that his, the paper spoke about him being the top of his form um, and it, achieving very good marks academically at the Brisbane Boys Grammar School. Uh, this story is from April 1914. Um, in addition to being uh, uh, really top, the top of his form academically, he was a champion athlete. Um, he excelled at cricket, rugby union, and athletics. In 1918, he was the captain of the first 15 rugby team and topped the batting average um, for cricket. Now, um, he won, after attending Brisbane Boys Grammar School, he wanted uh, to become a doctor. And in Queensland, that really meant you had to leave interstate. I don't think UQ had a medical school until 1939. So he had to attend university in Sydney. Um, and that, so then he went there. And again, um, he excelled academically um, in this larger pool. But it was also really, he was marked out as a champion athlete, uh, playing rugby union, playing cricket, and of course, athletics, uh, running and shot put. Whilst there, he participated in all aspects of university life, being on different committees um, and organizations, um, and participating in inter-university um, athletics. So for example, he was at a championship uh, where he was doing running and shot put, and they realized that they didn't have enough people for javelin. So they asked him if he could throw in the javelin event, and he told them that he'd never thrown a javelin before, so he couldn't go first. He had to wait and watch a few people do it. And then on his very first throw, he broke the Australian record. So that really sort of marked him out as being a very, um, very extraordinary, athletically gifted um, young man. Uh, but it was in rugby that he really focused his, um, his efforts while at university, particularly in the first few years while at university. 
Um, so he represented the Sid Sydney University from 1919 to 1925. It was an extraordinarily successful team in the club competition, uh, winning the premiership in 1919, 1920, 1923, and 1924. At the time, um, New South Wales was the only team that toured internationally. It was the only one that um, competed on a representative side against visiting national sides. So now it's considered the Australian team. So this, that brief period, because there was no Queensland team, they, they played under the banner New South Wales, but at some later point, I think in the 80s, it was deemed that that was the, the Australian team and they're now deemed official tests. So he was selected for that team, which is now considered the Australian team, against uh, the visiting South African team in 1921, uh, when he was still only 20 years old. Australia lost that match, 10 to 25, but Knopfling marked himself out as a real key player and had a very impressive debut, and he dropped kick to a four-pointer. He played in the second, third, and fourth matches against the Springboks and handled himself very well in all the games. The first Wallaby captain, Dr. Herbert Moran, would write years later of him that he was a remarkable athlete, a fast runner, javelin thrower, long jumper, an Australian representative in both cricket and football. Think about a perfectly built athlete of 13 stone who could run the 100 yards nearly in even time and kicked magnificently with either foot. He had every attribute for becoming the greatest footballer in the world except one, intuition. His unconscious mind never worked. Everything he did was done after slow calculation. From the touchline, I used to watch him thinking before he moved. In that long latent period were lost a thousand chances. He was a very fine player, but a man of poor physique. Like his contemporary, Xi'an, who could run rings around him, Xi'an did a brilliant thing and thought about it afterwards. So whilst um, that he's marked out there <laughs> that um, perhaps he didn't have the great intuition that he relied greatly on his um, sort of just energy and skills, um, he was the key player for New South Wales rugby for that period. Um, that next year, 1921, he was on the team that went to New Zealand, the only fullback on the tour, and he demonstrated his dur durability by playing in all 10 matches, the only one to do so. In 1922, a New Zealand squad toured and nothing played against them in all three games, including one with Johnny Taylor, who was the only other Australian um, to this date to play in both cricket and rugby union for the national squad. The New Zealand All Blacks also toured in 1922, and once more, Nothling was in three New South Wales matches against them. He basically had no sort of peers at his time in Australia as fullback at that time. He was acknowledged as the best fullback. Um, in 1923, again, uh, New Zealand was on tour and he played at fullback in all three games. Then the that later that year, Australia toured New Zealand and Nothling went with them, but he missed the first game because he was finishing his university exams. He always um, sort of highlight, he always put his university studies first, and that would continue throughout his career where he put his medical practice first. Um, he was still only 23 years of age at this time. The tour was a great success for him personally, but the team was extremely disappointing, winning only two of its 10 matches. The next year, 1924, was the 50th anniversary for New South Wales Rugby Union, so New Zealand sent a team across and the, for a four-match tour, which nothing played again. But that was his last match, um, ending his rugby representative career, and from this stage on, he really focuses on cricket. He had to at one time, uh, actually several times during his career, he had to publicly state that he wasn't interested in playing rugby league. I think even back then, uh, rugby league was always trying to poach rugby union players to play professionally for league. He was first selected, throughout that time that he was playing cricket for the university, he was also playing, um, oh, at the time he was playing rugby union, he was also playing cricket. Um, and in 1925, he was um, selected for, um, sorry, this, throughout, throughout that period, he was also representing New South Wales. So uh, in 1922, he played um, in Melbourne for the combined Australian university team um, against the touring English side, where he took 56, uh, he scored 56 and took five wickets. In that season, uh, playing for the university, he had the best bowling average in first grade cricket in Sydney. This article is from, um, the 21st of November 1924, and it talks about his debut for New, for New South Wales. And at that same game, um, Kipax, Alan Kipax, who had gone to be a very famous cricketer uh, for the Australian national squad, um, and um, including on the Bodyline series, 
here in Australia, um, debuted at the same match for New South Wales. Yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah, and I'll talk about him soon too, yeah, Bert Oldfield. And um, Kip Axe wrote the really good book about the Body Line series. Uh, so this is a photo from this time. Um, that's Northling here on the left. Uh, in the middle is Johnny Taylor, who's the only other dual international. He also played um, for Australia in cricket and rugby union. And I've just forgotten the guy on the far right's name, but he played for the University of Sydney as well. Um, so that was between 1922 and 1925. Um, Northling represented New South Wales five times. But he was always um, pursuing his academic career. So like in 1926, he was in Dubbo working as a medical examiner. Um, he moved, this is um, a report from one of his um, club games for the university where he took three wickets for 15 runs. He was now um, seeking to establish himself in the medical profession. And in January 1927, he was in Brisbane, whereupon he was taking a job with the hospital. And as you can see here, um, looking at joining the Valleys um, club team. It was very soon, before, it wasn't very long before he was actually playing for the Queensland Sheffield team. So he'd gone from playing for New South Wales to playing for Queensland. And here it says, Queensland's all around cricketer. Dr. Otto Nothling, former Sydney University star in cricket and rugger, has proved a dependable member of the Queensland Sheffield Shield team. He has batted and bowled admirably on the campaign among the century makers of the South. So he was, he was considered a very good uh, bowler as well as a capable batsman. And so between 1927 and 1929, he represented Queensland in 12 Sheffield Shield matches, including three as captain, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, in, 19, in November 1928, he was chosen for both an Australian 11 and Queensland 11 against the touring English side. Now, with um, I don't follow a lot of sport, but I kind of noticed that um, there's sort of associated sports stories. So with AFL and rugby, after the game, there's always stories about the disciplinary hearings and whether or not people will be banned for a match or two. But with cricket, the stories are all in the lead up about who will be selected, whether they're going to select horses for courses and who's in, and who's in and out of form. So this is um, a real turning point in Nothling's life, uh, was December 1928. Uh, the England was touring for the Ashes across Australia, and the first test had been in Brisbane. Uh, it was Don Bradman's debut, and he hadn't performed spectacularly. He got 18 and 1, um, and so he was going to be the 12th man, and they needed to bring in another bowler, another um, another player, and there was a lot of uh, speculation that it would actually be Otto Knopfling. So this is a story from, um, from December 1928, and then he was selected. He was down um, for the Australian team for the second test, which was to be held in Sydney. This is that team. It's a pity it's not a bigger photo, because this is really an extraordinary photo of a bunch of, um, I can't say they're all young men, a bunch of really um, extraordinary men that really typify what we see as a great Australian. Uh, so on the top left-hand corner is Bill Woodfull. Um, he's one of the greatest in Australian cricket, representing the noble ideal of the gentleman's sport. Um, he was the captain of both Victoria and Australia, and well remembered for his dignified and moral conduct, particularly during the body line series of 32 and 33. Next to him is Bill Ponsford. Um, so he and Brian Lara, uh, from the relatively current era, I think from West Indies, are the only two cricketers to ever twice score over 400 in an innings. Uh, the next guy, Herb Ironmonger, um, there, he lost one of his fingers in his bowling hand as a child, um, and he was born in 1882. This photograph is from 1928. So at that, when he's about to go on the field, he's 46 years old in that photo, and he would continue to play for quite a few more years. Uh, when he played his final test for Australia in the 1932-33 season against England, he was 50 years and 327 days. <laughs> so, and next to him, I don't know if you, if you can see that guy, who looks like he's the team manager, that's Don Blackie. Um, and he, that's actually his first test. This is him and Nothling are both debuting for Australia in this game. And so Don Blackie, on his debut, is aged 46 and 253 days which was a record for a test debut. He had been um, a mildly successful club cricketer um, growing up in Melbourne, playing for 
uh, club teams, and then he retired. And then at age 40, his doctor said he should take up cricket again for his health, and so he did. And then, it was only then that he came and he started representing his state and his country uh, well into his 40s. Unlike Nothling, he continued in on that series and played in the third and fourth tests against England. Oh, sorry. Um, that's Nothling there, um, Otter Nothling, before his debut against England. And uh, the, the furthest man, that's um, Hunter Hendry, whose nickname was Stork. And in the front row, um, you have uh, Vic Richardson. Uh, like Nothling, uh, Richardson was extremely uh, gifted in many sports. He was surely the only person to captain the national cricket team and the South Australian AFL team. He also represented Australia in baseball and South Australia in golf. He won the South Australia state tennis title and was also a leading local player in lacrosse, basketball, and swimming. He's grandfather uh, to three Australian cricketers, Ian, Greg, and Trevor Chapel. Uh, that guy there, Richardson. Uh, Trevor is the one whose sort of career is all overshadowed by a moment of madness when he bowled under underarm against um, the New Zealand in a limited overs game. Um, the next guy um, is Clary Grimmett. Uh, he was one of the really early spin bowlers, and he invented the flipper, which I think Shane Warren has perfected. I actually don't know a lot about cricket, so but if anybody, if I'm making, um, the, the guy in the middle, this guy, um, the, the very large man, um, Jack Ryder, he's the captain at the time. Um, so at, the, at the, that period, the selection, I'm not sure if this is still the case, but the selection board had three men, one of whom was the captain. So he was actually on the selection board which chose the team, which chose Nothling. But two years later on the selection board, he, when they were selecting the team, he was outvoted by the other two guys to, to remain on it. So him as captain, he not only lost the captaincy, but he um, was kicked off the team by the selection board, even though he was on it. And it was at, and it was at that time that uh, Woodfull became the captain uh, in 1932. Um, next to him is um, the guy carrying the drinks, Don Bradman, um, who um, is very young. He, um, he's, some might say he was even lucky to be in the squad at that point after not being entirely um, extraordinary in the first match, just taking 18 and then one uh, runs. Uh, next to him is Bert Oldfield, um, who had been shot in the leg in World War I um, and was, was a wicketkeeper for many, many years. Uh, despite not appearing in nearly as many tests as people like um, uh, Gilchrist and other modern day players, he still holds the record uh, for, for 52 stumpings despite um, being many, many less tests than other uh, players. And then finally, um, you have Alan Kipax, who was an extraordinary player um, for many, many years, considered one of the best of his generation. Um, so Nothling performed okay, but not spectacular. Um, his figures of eight and 44 with the bat, and zero for 72 off of 46 overs, whilst better than Bradman in the previous test, um, didn't unfortunately um, retain his spot. So that was his, this um, testing in Sydney was his first and only one um, for the Australian uh, team. Um, in 1929, he was appointed, 1929 was a big year for him. It's when he moved to Maribra and he was appointed as the captain of the Queensland Sheffield Shield team, which was quite a story at the time. Um, the, the selection panel didn't like the the captain, uh, O'Connor, um, and they very publicly um, switched Nothling for him, even though Nothling didn't like replacing O'Connor. He, he was pretty unhappy with the way it happened. Um, here you have, I'm sure that these articles must be from the truth, I think, but these are a few um, weeks out, one where O'Connor is appointed and then one where, where he's deposed and then one where he's brought back in. So uh, Nothling was the captain for three matches, Sheffield Shield matches. Um, and so 1929 was the period where he came to play uh, for Maribra. Um, and this is, um, so B Bannerman, which was Cecil Lowther, uh, he wrote, uh, well, he wrote 900 poems. I've transcribed 700 of them. I'm going to be publishing his entire works of Cecil Lowther. But he was a big cricket fan, and he named himself after Alec Bannerman, who was a uh, cricket player. I'll read this to you. So this is on the 19th of March, 1929. Welcome to Dr. Nothling. 
Here's a hearty welcome, doctor, unto our city fair, and when you play the king of games, I hope that I am there. Our cricketers will look to you to show them how to play and how to bowl and how to bat in proper style and way. You showed us on the 17th the way to bowl with spin and how to drop the gallus ball that took the batsman in. You showed the way to use the bat by playing true and straight and how to place and use your feet to utilize your weight. So in the glorious game of life, may great success be yours and may you win respect of all and honor that endures. Good sportsman means good citizen and that will still maintain so doctor, here's the best of luck, and may you long remain. Um, so there was quite a bit of um, excitement about the, 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 the cricketer for Queensland and the captain of Queensland and somebody who played for Australia less than five months earlier uh, moving here to be the doctor. Um, so he was playing um, for his club here was the, the call, club called the Pass Grammars, and he was also playing for the Maribor representative side. And so from 1929, he was practicing medicine um, here in, in Maribor and very quickly became very involved in the community, uh, with whether it's associations, um, with the hospital, um, and helping people with their cricket. Um, so one of the, if you, you know, if you've done much research into Maribor history, you'll know there's you know, a few major families uh, involved in business and politics. And one of the names right there at the top is the Hosboroughs. Uh, so this is the engagement announcement um, from, in, from December 1931, the engagement between uh, one of the Hosborough girls, uh, Mildred, and Dr. Knopfling. Um, and then the marriage was on the 1st of June 1932. And I'll just read to you um, a report from that, um, that event. Hos Knopfling Hosborough. The crowds of spectators, which overflowed St. Paul's Church on the evening of June 1, streaming down the passageway and surrounding the gates, gave testimony of the popularity of the bridal pair on that occasion. The bride is the descendant of one of the most respected and one of the oldest established families of this city, and the bridegroom, who besides the popularity gained by him as a medico of exceptional ability, has also made himself well known to the sporting fraternity by his prowess at cricket he being at one time captain of the state cricket team. A knight of incomparable beauty, clear cloudless skies with just the sharp crispness of early winter in the air, gave added zest to the proceedings. The beauty of the night being a romantic setting to the scene. The contracting parties were Dr. Otto Ernest Nothling, fourth son of Mr. and Mrs. C.M. Nothling, Highgate Hill, South Brisbane, and Mildred Melville Hosborough, elder daughter of Mr. and Mrs. J.M. Hosborough of Maribor. The ceremony was performed by Reverend Elliot. Mr. Hosborough gave his daughter away. Red and white roses with Virginia creeper entwined gave out their sweet fragrance and graced the church with their decorations. The beautiful wedding bell being also composed of roses. The bride was attended by three bridesmaids, Mrs. Beth Hosborough, sister of the bride, being chief. Miss F. Nothling, sister of the bridegroom, and Miss Nan Barton of Tawaran Station. Dr. Outridge of Gympie and Mr. J. Nanagar supported the bridegroom as best man and groomsman. The bride's dress was, was of parchment satin, tight-fitting bodice, full-flared skirt with train, long tulle veil, also of parchment shade, held in place with wreath of gold leaves. The bride received a beautiful bouquet of cream roses and gladiolas. The bridesmaids' dresses were all of apple green ring velvet, Miss Beth Hosborough being made in early Victorian style, the other two bridesmaids, bridesmaids wearing dresses fashioned on the new long straight lines with flair, touches of pink velvet on green, cow black. With these frocks were worn hats to match, green with pink trimmings and pink shoes. All three bridesmaids carried shower bouquets of pink radiant roses. The bridal party left the church to the grand sweet strains of Mendelssohn's wedding march, of which a merry peal of nine bells in the church tower added their quota. It was with much difficulty that the newly wedded pair made their exit from the church through the dense crowd of well-wishers, and many were the congratulations received. At the home of the bride's parents, Beauvert in Woodstock Street, the guests were received by Mrs. J.M. Hosborough, gowned in a modern long straight costume of royal blue marquette, 
flared skirt, small coatie, trimmed with buff colored fur, costume finished with gold spray, velour hat to match, and carrying a bouquet of cream roses. The bridegroom's mother was dressed in a costume of black Moroccan with black velvet coat and hat to harmonize. African marigolds formed the decorations for the bridal and guest tables, the same color scheme being used in the tall draperies, which bedecked the candlesticks. A handsome wedding cake, three-tier, square-shaped, the work of Mrs. Larson, had decorations of cricket bats and footballs in honor of the bridegroom. <laughs> the honeymoon is being spent touring the southern states. The bride departed dressed in a brown costume of diagonal tweed with hat to harmonize. Shortly before 8 o'clock on the wedding night, just as Mr. and Mrs. Knopfling were extending a hearty welcome to the guests of the evening, and as sincere good wishes were ringing true, out of the stillness of the night and the calm serenity of the Mary River rang out a sharp, shrill tone of a steamer's cock-a-doodle-doo. <laughs> Realizing at once that an unusual tribute and one of rare occurrence was being paid to the bridal part pair, Mrs. Knopfling, in her beautiful bridal setting under the brilliance of the electric light, graciously acknowledged the tribute. Immediately followed, um, as from an instantaneous command, a gallant, gallant sailor's cheer from the lusty voices of the crew of the SS Maruya. It was ship's honors, a tri sailor's tribute, and seaman's congratulations as the vessel steadily steamed past the residence of the bride's parents. It was an inspiring spectacle to all present and a gallant action on the part of Captain J. Lamont, his officers and crew. The tribute was most impressive and was really never to be forgotten. It had the ring of sincerity and goodwill and the kindly thought that made the scene so striking. This splendid action was highly appreciated and in honoring the bridal pair, so too was a gracious tribute paid to the home of Mr. and Mrs. J. M. Hosborough and a name so well and popularly known throughout the Wide Bay and dis Burnett districts. So you can see um, the reporting has changed a lot too in the newspaper. Um, you never see, an, never see an article like that now. Yeah. Um, so he continued to play cricket in Maribor, and you can see here, um, this is from across the state. Um, um, I mean, that first one actually, I think is actually international. I mean, they talk about Sydney being reported. But he played for his club, the Past Grammars, as well as Maribor. And um, this, was, and this was, um, it wasn't really fair. I mean, he'd just been playing for Australia. Um, and now he's bowling out Gainda, all 10 bowlers for um, 15 runs, I think. Yeah, all 10 batting. Um, yeah, he took, he took all 10 wickets for 16 runs against Gainda. You know, so, so he came here and he really, um, he, he, was able, he was still young, he'd only just been playing for Australia, captaining his state, so he, re he did really well here playing for Maribor. Um, but he didn't actually play for very long uh, in terms of representing Maribor. Uh, this article is from the 20th of February, 1930, and it's his retirement from representing, representative cricket, cricket, this being for Maribor. So just over a year after being selected for Australia and, this, and selected as Queensland captain, in a matter of weeks after taking 10 wickets for 16 runs, he retired uh, from the Maribor rep side, uh, representing the city. He still played on um, club sport recreationally. Um, however, in January 1933, he was selected to play for the Queensland country team um, against an English side in Toowoomba. Um, he then took a break from cricket for three years um, and returned in January 1938 to great success. Uh, but that was uh, largely, as you'll see there in the end, um, Dr. Nothing said he regretted exceedingly having to leave cricket, but he was working up his practice and he realized it would be folly to sacrifice his future advancement for any branch of sport. Um, so he, just as he had sort of left rugby union really at the peak of his uh, ability, here he is uh, leaving cricket, you know, in the very shadow of representing Australia in the tests to focus on his medical career. He was putting himself forward to the city council uh, in the 1933 election. Um, so the, generally the history of Australian politics after the initial stages of being free trade versus protectionist is labor versus anti-labor. So you have the labor party going back right to federation, almost to federation, and then, or even before into different names. And then you have whatever uh, party is opposing them on the conservative sides. Uh, for the past 50 years or so, it's some kind of sort of joke that no overseas visitors or observers can understand that opposition is called the liberals. 
uh, which doesn't make any sense in terms of ideology to cons all the conservatives and the liberals. But here, um, as you know, just as on the federal level, you have liberals and labor. On the council level, until fairly recently, uh, and certainly back then, you had the labor candidates running on an official labor ticket, and then you had whoever they were opposing. And Otto Knopfling fell in um, with the non-labor side, which was made up of businessmen and hoteliers and merchants. Um, and they called themselves the Citizens Party. So he first stood in the 1933 election, um, and you'll see this newcomer, Tamara, came very close to topping the poll. Uh, so Billy Domain um, got the top, uh, four th about 4,300, and Northland got 3,400 votes, just a bit more than Matthews. Uh, but, so you had the two parties running, but the actual mayor at the time, um, Bashford, was an independent. He was elected unopposed, but he died immediately after the election. So they had to hold a by-election. And so Domain resigned his seat and was um, elected unopposed to the mayor, the mayoralty. Um, after the 19, that 1933 election, Labour had five out of the eight seats. And then with the mayor, they, they had a strong majority. So Nothling was effectively uh, the leader of the opposition. He stood again in 1936. Um, and you'll see here um, some of their ads for the Citizens Party. Uh, that first one's interesting uh, because we take for granted now that the Maribor City Hall has a town clock, but that was an addition that Domain added, um, and they make the point um, that it disturbed the Georgian-American colonial architectural symmetry of it. Also, it was a lot of money, so they sort of made the point that they wouldn't be so, um, so they, would, they would be a bit more spendthrift with their money. 1936 was an interesting election because uh, the citizens, despite Nothling being effectively the leader, they put up somebody else as the mayoral candidate, North, um, which uh, was Reed. He lost to Domain, so Domain was re-elected as mayor, but the citizens candidate, the citizens party run, uh, led by Nothling, got the majority of the seats on council. So when Nothling had the majority and was therefore um, able to become deputy mayor, but um, Domain was the mayor and was frustrated at times because he couldn't get his way. The next election was in 19, oh, and this is some reports from 1936 as well, which has the mayoral vote. Um, you'll see that um, it was very close too. Domain didn't beat um, Reed by a whole lot. Um, and like any time, there's always uh, recounts and it changes. So you have um, Nothing again. You'll see under both the original count and the recount, Nothing got the top vote for Alderman, and this is a, a report from Interstate where it talks about a um, famous cricketer getting elected to council. So that was 1936, um, and so that period was, was still very stable for uh, the council despite uh, having one party as mayor and the other party in the majority. 1939, there were actually three uh, parties contesting. There was Labour, led by Domain. There was Protestant Labour. This was before the, what's referred to as the split in labor. This was kind of a bit different. It wasn't the Catholics breaking off. It was um, Protestant labor and the Citizens Party again. The Citizens, though, didn't put up a mayoral candidate. So the election for mayor this time was between labor and Protestant labor. Uh, and labor won, but the Citizens won a majority. Um, uh, oh, no, the Citizens um, lost this time. So this meant that... Um, the uh, Labour had both the majority and the mayoralty. So uh, Labour Labor had four aldermen and the mayor, the citizens three, which included Northling, and uh, Protestant Labour. So going into that election, um, Northling gave um, the speech which sort of summed up the citizens at the very last meeting before the election. And uh, the report at the time said, Alderman Nothling remarked that at all times business was freely debated and the mayor had certainly placed few restrictions on aldermen. So long as the Citizens Party had control, they would have open debate and the rate payers would have full reports in the press. As the controlling party in the council for the last three years, the Citizens Party claimed a good deal of credit for the position of the council today. They had adopted a progressive policy and had certainly pushed forward with sewerage. When they took over, matters in connection with that scheme were rather chaotic. Consulting engineers were appointed, and everybody should be satisfied with the progress which had been made. Steps had been taken to ensure that Maribor would not be left in the lurch with its aerodrome. They realized that air travel was a thing in the future, and if they neglected to improve the aerodrome, Maribor would become a dead end as it was with the railway. 
The works gangs had been built up and the works program was proceeding smoothly with the laying down of bitumen roads and maintaining those which already had been constructed. So despite not being, having the mayorship, they really referred to themselves as the controlling party because they could um, carry any motion as a majority. Sorry, Kathy. <laughs> um, so, um, so immediately after that election, uh, the end of April, um, the, the press reported in part, Saturday's poll reversed the position of the council insofar as party groups are concerned. The citizens dominated the previous council by five to four. The new council will be constituted of five official labor men, including the mayor, one Protestant labor man, Alderman Rex, and three citizens, Alderman Nothling, Kin, and Dunn. To what extent direct party appeals influence the vote is impossible to say definitely without an actual analysis of the group results, although Saturday's figures indicate that but for the labor split, the citizens' party would probably have been routed. What is more definite is that the electors desire to change and has transferred the balance of power from the citizens to labor. Um, so he actually was, it wasn't very long after that election in April 1939 before Knopfling resigned, um, and that was um, in June 1940. Now everyone likes to think that as soon as they um, leave an organization it'll collapse and um, it can't go on without them, but that really happened in the meeting after Knopfling resigned. Um, basically nothing happened for three hours because they had to appoint who was going to replace him. Um, and so the, the what, what sometimes happens with meetings is people try and st outstay it, so they try and stay there for hours and hours and so other people will leave and then suddenly they'll have the majority. But I can't even really quite make out what happened here and because we are currently um, gutting the admin building where the minutes are, I can't get to the minutes, but usually the reports are more accurate than the minutes. But basically it went for three and a half hours, the lawyers were called, and they didn't really do anything, just try to wait out each other so they could appoint their own person. But in the end, um, Dunn nominated, uh, a citizen's candidate was appointed uh, to Knopfling's vacancy. At the time, um, at about this time, he was the directors of one of the local cleaning companies. This is the Maribra um, Laundry and Dry Cleaning Service of which Dr. Knopfling was uh, director. Um, his reason uh, for resigning was to um, join the service. As you can see here, this is um, a story, I think, from The Truth in New South Wales. Um, so he was appointed major in the Australian Army Medical Corps on the 12th of July, 1940. Uh, so that's just after his, um, the final meeting at council. Uh, he sailed for the Middle East in December as second in command of the second and third casualty clearing station. He served in Greece and on Crete, but poor health uh, forced his return to Australia and his uh, appointment was terminated on the 2nd of October, 1943, whereupon he returned to practice here in Maribor. Um So that's uh, sometime after that. Um, this must be your father? So Eddie Dunn. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Eddie Dunn. So that at some point they went into partnership. Um, he had been, I think Nothing had been practicing out of that lovely house next to St. Stephen's. It's 19 Sussex Street, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, good. Yeah, you're doing a good job doing it up. Yeah. Um, so in that lovely house next to the oldest church building in Maribor, he'd been practicing out of there. Um, and then he moved in, in partnership with Dr. Dunn uh, to the Commercial Bank of Australia Chambers on Kent Street. Um, but again, he was always looking to a new frontier. And so he was obtaining a diploma in dermatological medicine. Uh, which he achieved in 1949 from the University of Sydney, and then he set up as a specialist in Brisbane. Um, he was the first skin specialist appointed to the Brisbane Child Children's Hospital um, and a council member of the Dermatological Society of Australia. Um, at the time, um, um, so then he, 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 maintained, he, came, he maintained his uh, role down in Brisbane with uh, the different associations, whether it was the Medical Association, Cricket, uh, and Union. And I found this article, which seemed interesting. Um, I think this is the first night game, and um, he's an umpire. Um, former, so he was, and um, 
So he was an umpire in, the very, in the, what appears to be the first night game here. Um, so his legacy, um, he has an outstanding, outstanding legacy in rugby, cricket, athletics, and golf. Uh, he died in 1965, um, 65 years old. Uh, therefore, not in his lifetime was he recognized as a dual national because at that time, they still hadn't officially made the New South Wales squad, the Australian squad. That happened um, 20 years later, 1986, uh, when the Australian Rugby Union decreed that New South Wales games would be upgraded to Australian status. And at that point, it was recognized that him and Johnny Taylor were the only two men to play in both the Wallabies and the cricket team. He's therefore credited with 19 test caps and 14 non-test caps um, for rugby and, of course, the one uh, for cricket. According to Dr. John Belisara, a friend and colleague, he was in many respects a naive, lovable, big, overgrown boy who never grew up. He was remembered as gregarious and ever cheerful. His most outstanding quality was his loyalty to his friends. And I think um, it's really one of his really sterling tributes of him, one of his, uh, to his legacy, is that so many different associations claim him. You know, he's on the University of Sunshine Coast um, Sportsman's Hall of Fame. Maribor recognizes him, golf, cricket, athletics, University of, um, in Sydney. Uh, Brisbane Boys Grammar still um, really celebrates him in a lot of their history books. Um, the golf club, if you go to the Maribor Golf Club, you'll see his name in large letters on many of the honor boards and remembered. The Wide Bay Club, um, his hometown of Wida. Um, so I think it was an extraordinary life, you know, very well lived and one that Maribor can be very proud of. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.